You are so involved, gents, in building beautiful, vibrant cities. So first of all, Jeff, for you, what makes a city special? What are the vital ingredients that make a city work from your perspective? I think there's obviously a few. I mean, I think first and foremost, you know, things start with food and beverage, <laughs> you know, because that's what I do. Uh, and but why would but, you but, say that? But I think food, beverage, and hospitality end up really grounding and moving a city forward. I think that, you know, not only are the, you know, eat, eating, drinking, and sleeping are the only three things that people actually need to do, right, before you get into everything else. And, you know, I'm fortunate to be in a position where that's what I do. And, you know, it's a great example of how you move a city forward. You know, when I came here to Miami, you know, about a little over three years ago, um, you know, we came to a city that was really just starting to evolve. And I found a city where there was a big opening where there was not great elevated food and beverage experiences. And in the last two and a half years in South Florida, we've opened about 14, you know, fine dining restaurants. Mm -hmm. And what we've seen is that people responded incredibly well. The people in the community that were here already welcomed them. And I think it brought about, you know, we saw it bring about a piece of what was about to come, which was all these great people coming down here. They need places to eat, they need places to drink, they need places to sleep. And, you know, I think that that's where it starts. And I think that, um, you know, we've, we've been a big part of that in Miami, and I think that you see something very similar happening right now in the kingdom. Um, in terms of other things, I think you have, you know, the other great people sitting right here. You know, what comes next? Sports, music, you know, all the other things that people can come together around. I mean, whether so, so, and so, talk about around the dinner table. So, Steve and Tom, you, you, you agree that, that food is the most important thing, obviously, because you've got to eat. I mean, if, Good if, food. if it's major food groups involved, then the answer is yes. Yeah. Look, I, I think Miami is, is a great example. It, is a, it might be the most vibrant, vibrant city in the country right now. And I think I, I say often, Miami is a curator of culture for the rest of the country, in some ways the world. Fashion, sports, music, food, art. Um, all of these things, you know, the values that people have, the original thought, original things happening. And, you know, we talk about it often, just like excellence. You know, doing things really, really well. Um, those things become models for other cities, for other places. And when you have those things, then you have a, a very vibrant city mm. people want to be a part of. You know, for me, uh, I feel like what makes a vibrant city has changed in the last 10, 20, and 30 years. Uh, specifically, when you think about it, it's never been easier in the history of, 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 of the formation of companies to relocate, right? So you can relocate your headquarters uh, quickly to a new city. And as a result of that, what you're looking for in that new city um, and what your expectations are from that new city um, has changed. So we could talk about what Tom said, cultural dynamism, um, where people love the dynamics of culture and it's specifically multicultural for the kind of employees that they're looking for. Uh, they want a diverse uh, employee base, um, as well as the innovation that comes from a diverse employee base. That's one of the things that make a dynamic city. The other thing that makes a dynamic city is, you know, People used to have to leave cities, leave their hometown in order to make it, right? So if you're a recording artist or you're a visual artist or whatever you did, you'd have to leave your hometown because your hometown did not have that discipline for you to go all the way. And now in the, the shift and the changes over the last 10, 20 years, there is no such location, right? So um, those shifts have, I think, has moved what it requires to be you know, consider the dynamic city. Mm -hmm. And I, I think too, it's, it's, it's about young people, right? So a lot of the greatest creativity comes from, you know, 18 to 25, 27 year old brain that's unencumbered by experience and context and wisdom and, and it's open and it's free and it's neural pathways haven't been grooved yet deeply. And young people create some of the greatest music, some of the greatest musicians and artists of our time 
their best works were still when they were 22 years old or something. And so we have to attract young people. We have to have a cultural dynamic where young people can afford to live there, where business opportunities exist for young entrepreneurs, where it's easy to start businesses and to, and to create, you know, whether that's restaurants, you know, they, they want to live somewhere where you go downstairs and, and there's a bakery and it's not a Panera Bread and there's a coffee shop and it's not a Starbucks and, there's a, and, and they have these organic cultural things that are being created, but clothing I, stores, yeah. you know, that's, music shops, everything. That sounds like how we grew up. That's what we had. It's Greenwich Village in the, in the 60s. It's, yeah. Um, how do you have it now? Spanish Harlem. It's, you know, we, we, need to, we need to foster those types of neighborhoods and environments to attract young people because that's where the real creativity. Well, it's also I, Richard Florida's sort of the rise of the creative class stuff where, you know, if you go put your company in Moline, Illinois, the talent's not going to go there. The talent goes to the city that attracts, that has the culture that attracts young talent, and the companies go there, not the other way around. The, the key when you talk about young people, is to embrace emerging subcultures, right? So if you talk about like New York City in the late 80s, whether it was graffiti, which became art, or hip hop music, which became global music, these subcultures became mainstream pop culture because they were harnessed in that city where young people were allowed to purvey and do their thing. And the same thing happens in food and, in, 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 with chefs. I look at chefs, recording artists, visual artists, um, the, the exact same way, where you have to create a platform, a city has to create a platform, a refuge uh, for this young talent to be able to, to live and express themselves freely. And that's very, very important when you start talking about the, dyna the dynamics of creating a, a, you know, a vibrant city. And I think that's one of the key things, right, which is the, the city embracing it. And I think that's something that you've seen here in the last few years, which is that none of this would be possible. The subcultures, the emerging artists, any of the talent that came here, any of the restaurants that open here, any of the music that's being recorded here, if the city was not behind this growth and wasn't behind everything that we're trying to do here. So many cities get in your way and are in the way of you trying to succeed or trying to bring the most talented people in whatever their field may be to create and draw more people. And that's, I think, one of the most special things about Miami. Years ago, um, so I, I, I started my career in the, in, in the music business. And um, in 97, we came down here to Miami, uh, to South Beach, and Emil Estefan had and still has beautiful recording studios. And we recorded a Will Smith's album. And when we came down here, he ultimately made a song because of the environment, uh, Welcome to Miami, which was, became a big hit and basically was a free tourism ad <laughs> uh, uh, for Miami. But I do remember when he came down here, uh, and he wrote this in the line, he, he, he was surprised by, he said the line, all, rages, all ages and, and, and races, many different faces um, and many different races, Jamaican, Asian, black, Cuban, and, and, and the idea of that melting pot all, you know, in the same proximity was something surprising uh, to all of us when we came to Miami, and that's what made it very, very special, um, and obviously led to, to him making that song. So to all of our points, I do believe that this idea of multicultural, this idea of embracing emerging subcultures and helping foster that is all the things and the ingredients that this city gets really well and a couple other cities get really well and you know, you see a lot of cities don't get that well. Uh, they, don't, they don't support diversity, they don't have diversity and they, they don't get the best young talent, they don't get the best um, young chefs and restaurants, they don't, they don't get, or athletes or teams because they're not part of that, that ingredient to create that, that dynamic, vibrant environment. So do you know what I'm thinking right now, the, the pillars of the FII Institute Think, exchange, act. You thought, you've exchanged. So what is the action? I know that you are really enamored with Miami, yeah. but if you take these essential ingredients that we've been discussing, can we then cook up another Miami? 
Not 100%. No. no. Called the kingdom. You know, I think what's happening there. You know what I mean? I think that that's why we're here, right? I think there's a lot of similarities between what's happening in the kingdom and what's happening, what's happening here in Miami. Um, because I think they're both fostering environments where people can grow, people can excel in their fields, they want to attract talent, no different than Miami, and there's so many parallels between what's going on here and what's going on there in regards to, you know, growing diversity, growing talent, growing homegrown talent, but also bringing in the best of the best and fostering their ability to perform there, whether it be in sports, music, restaurants, or any of the other great cultural verticals. Uh, and the density of young people, obviously, it's been written about, the density of young people in the kingdom um, is, you know, the, 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 the fastest, the most dense uh, of young people. And, and when you have young people feeling optimistic about what they can do, um, you basically are writing the future. Again, it's like, it's like I said earlier about we, you need to foster an environment young people want to go to. So for Miami, they need affordable places to live. You need a business-friendly environment where entrepreneurs, some bartender who has an idea, a concept of a bar they want to open can easily obtain a liquor license and find capital to go open a bar or a restaurant or uh, whatever that business is they want to start. So you need, you need a business-friendly environment and, but you also need certain things, affordable place to, a place to live, transportation, uh, and then the cultural things, you know, restaurants to go to, sporting events to go to, professional sports, uh, you know, places to interact with other young people where creative ideas are fostered. It's, you know, whatever, Paris in the 40s or Greenwich Village in the 60s or, these, you know, these environments where creativity blossoms because young people are there and, and attracted to be there and they come from all over the world to be there. And I think Miami has a really unique opportunity to be that. I'm thinking about the impact of uh, a medium that we have right now where we all can talk about our cities that we love. We can hype them. Um, they can be hyped uh, socially, online. That trend for a restaurateur, that's quite challenging for a sports team or sports huge. teams or sports team. It's a big deal. No, it's a, it's like a, the public it's, has a voice. It's a huge amplifier. Yeah. Right? I mean, you talk about, uh, yeah, uh, we may not want to admit it, but a lot of people in this room has become food photographers. <laughs> uh, and oh, you just start posting the meal you had, and all of a sudden, that restaurant or that chef or that food group, you know, uh, their, their voice is amplified. Or you have a uh, fandom, and the expression of fandom of a team or an individual athlete has been amplified as a result of having all of these different social mediums. And obviously, the same thing with music. I, I say it all the time, Instagram and TikTok has become the new MTV. And that has also created, you know, fandom and following for up and coming uh, emerging artists. So social media has completely amplified all of these cultural sort of silos um, yeah. to, to become much more irrelevant. Amplified for the good or not? Well, that's what I was just gonna say. There's two, there's two sides to that, right? Where you know, we're living in an era of isolation, partly from a generation growing up on social media, the post-pandemic world. Uh, and, and, you know, there, there's a study that says that loneliness today, like loneliness actually correlates negatively to life expectancy more than cigarette smoking. Um, people are in isolation, teen depressions at an all-time high. Well, what is the solve for that? It's bringing people together. I tell the team that works with us, like, what we do is really important. It's not just a football game, a soccer match, a music concert, an F1 race. You're bringing people together to share life together, to share experiences. And it's what music is, it's what hosp great hospitality is, is sharing a meal together, bringing people together to experience life together, even if they're still taking a selfie and posting it on Instagram, yeah. is really important to, to what life is. And so, um, you know, the social media aspect of it can be negative, but you can turn it into something positive. But ultimately, we need people to gather together to experience life together, and that's really what we all do. Yeah, no, I, mean, I, I was going to agree. I mean, listen, there's, there's nothing that's more Instagram than food, right? I mean, that's a, a fact. And I think that, 
you know, in many ways that's great, but in many ways to, you know, and it does help amplify business. It starts creating trends, it starts creating hype, but I think that's also one of the things people have to be careful about when they're looking at what businesses are great and what things are, because things get hyped up very quickly, and is there actually substance behind it? And is there actually gonna, is there actually a real, real future to these restaurants? Is there actually a real future to these chefs? Is there actually a real future to deciphering between what's a trend and what's not? Because something can be incredibly hot and maybe one out of a hundred takes off and the others don't. And so that's something when, from an investment perspective, which obviously is relevant here, you know, when you're looking at these businesses and you're looking at how they grow, you know, those things can be disillusioning. And I think to Tom's point, you know, there's also the negative of that people have lost track of, you know, the importance of, you know, this is all about culture, right? W what is culture? Culture is something that people can sit around and discuss, right? You take it in and then you sit with each other and you discuss it. And you often discuss it over drinks and a meal or at a sports game, right? And the phone and the Instagram has taken away from that in the sense that you, you're on it all the time and, you know, I won't even, you know, I always say I won't, I won't sit at a table with people that are on their phones taking pictures because what's the point? We could all just be eating alone. Yeah. And that dialogue, that dynamic, and that conversation that takes place that the three of us have all the time, yeah. it, it, it literally, yeah. uh, I was, I was that the three of us have all the time yeah. is, is... So you talk about we, how to make yeah. a city greater. You actually sit down yeah. and have that chat. No, we, we, we've had this conversation all the time because I have a very optimistic point of view on this. Like, I, I don't want to be the person that just walks around and shorting the stock on young people. Like, I, I remember specifically in the 70s when they were latchkey kids. Latchkey kids were kids that would come home from school and then when both parents went into the workforce. And everybody thought in like 1976 that these kids who came home from school when there was nobody home, they were going to turn out to be losers because they had no uh, mother at home when they got home. And that socially didn't turn out to be as bad as everybody thought it would be. Yeah. Or, you know, the, the internet in general did not turn out to be as bad as everybody thought it would be. I do believe that things correct themselves mm -hmm. and that we're going through this time and period right now where social media, we can look at it and talk about all the negatives and how it affects young people. I was a victim of that myself in another medium but I think it works itself out over time, and I do believe, and I'm gonna be the optimist on this topic, that it'll work itself out all the time. And, and I'm fine with that. I, I, I believe in young people, I believe in the values of young people, and I also believe that it will correct themselves and it will turn out okay. Young, young people today are brilliant. I mean, if you think about it, you know, they have the internet, they have Google, they have all these things at their fingertips. We had World Books Encyclopedia, and it was like aardvark, and you'd start, you'd start reading and try to learn something. You know, my son was into aviation, out of nowhere, you know, at 14 years old, he's, he's into planes. Next thing you know, he's, he's on the computer on a simulator. Next thing you know, he's 17 years old. And he's up on a plane flying, getting his pilot's license. I mean, you, you can just, you can just choose to be into something and learn about it so fast today. And young people, their curiosity in the way that we're, I mean, I, I tap into, we have lunches and things where I find talented young people that we have a very young organization. So and I'm asking 25-year-olds all the time, like, what should I be looking at? What's yeah, new? Yeah. What's, their brains and their intelligence just blows me away every day. Gentlemen, thank you for giving us insight into, from your perspective, what makes a vibrant city. That was a quick transition, but yeah. thank you so uh, much. Yeah, this is, it was an Richard, thank you for having ex, us. It was thank an you, express. Richard. I could thank tell you. that you were about to deliver. We're about to get into it much Deep deeper. Yeah. Yeah. I know. Get, there's layers to this. I could yeah. tell from the breath uh, well, we'll that you were all about Brazil, to take. Richard. Thank you. But I'm actually going to say to you, Tom Garfinkel, Vice Chairman, CEO and President of Miami Dolphins and Hard Rock Stadium, Managing Partner, FI, uh, uh, FI Miami Grand Prix. Ooh, that, that was not a lot of oh. titles, Tom. Oh. That was not necessary. Oh. Flowers, please, Stop. for Tom. For Steve Stout, Founder and CEO, Translation and United Masters. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. And Jeff Lazanik. Co-owner of Major Food Group. Who was at Carbone last night? Okay. Hey, how was it? <laughs> Fantastic. Fantastic. All right. Tom, yes. right. Tom, Jeff, Steve, thank you, thank you very, very much. much. Thank Appreciate you. Very much. you. Thank, thank you, gentlemen. Thank you so much. Thank you. Take care.